Judge, I want to continue where we left off yesterday and try to get, if I can, get to the essence of this tension between judicial power and judicial restraint. Um, you have testified, and stop me if I get this wrong, that judges should stay in their lane. And I think it's fair to say that one of your definitions of staying in your lane is that judges don't make policy. Am I right so far? Yes, that is correct, Senator. Then how do you explain or help me understand the following? We have a judicially created doctrine with no textual basis either in the Constitution or a statute called substantive due process. And through substantive due process, our, our federal courts, let's just narrow it down, the United States Supreme Court has given itself the authority to read into the Constitution unenumerated, unmentioned rights. Not read the Constitution and say, well, there it is, freedom of speech. But these are unmentioned, unenumerated. Isn't that making policy? Senator, the Supreme Court interprets provisions of the Constitution, and there are provisions of the Constitution that require interpretation because they don't um, just on the text in every circumstance answer the question before the court. So due process, what, what does that mean? And the Supreme Court has, the words due process do um, appear in the text of the Constitution, yeah. and the question is what what is covered by that provision? The Supreme but, Court, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, ahead. but when they do it, aren't they making policy? Well, Senator, um, the role of the judiciary is to interpret the law to the extent that somebody argues to the court um, that there's been a violation of the due process clause of the Constitution, um, it is within the role of the court to determine what that means, whether the person is correct that what happened with respect to their case violated the due process clause. And so there's an interpretive function um, that is a part of the judicial function. Here, 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 let me see if I can put a finer point on this. Um, it's not the right so much. Mm. It, it's, it's how the right is created. That's why I asked you yesterday whether you think that unenumerated these unenumerated, unmentioned rights ought to be decided by the people through their elected representatives versus the, the federal judiciary. Let's take two rights that I talked about yesterday, the, the right to assisted suicide, the right of a transgender woman to participate in women's sports. Um, I can see... How I'm not predicting that, that it will, but I could see how the court, uh, either through the due process clause or the Ninth Amendment, could find those rights in the Constitution. Um, as we talked about yesterday, 
uh, the Supreme Court has looks to me like they've adopted the 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 the, uh, the, the policy of there is no test for a fundamental right. Um, there are several tests, and in Obergefell, Justice Kennedy cited with approval uh, Justice Harlan's dissent in uh, in Poe v. Ullman, which says there's no test; we go case by case. And the te- but but I know there are tests like I- I'll get the language here somewhere. I've got it. I don't want to look it up, but. Uh, implicit in the concept of ordered liberty, and you've talked about that. Here's a new one that Justice Kennedy talked about in Obergefell. He said, inherent in the concept of individual autonomy. Well, I can see how if the court with five votes wanted to say, even though the right to assisted suicide or the right of a transgender woman to participate in women's sports. I I can see how somebody, you're smart, you could write an opinion and say that's that's inherent in the concept of individual autonomy. And and maybe, again, it's not the right. It's who's supposed to decide. And that's where the judicial restraint comes in. I mean, don't you think that the values of ordinary Americans and their ability to decide these issues are just as good as those of, a, of, of five members of the Supreme Court? Thank you, Senator. The, there are um, policy determinations that are made by vote and absolutely in the democratic process. Um, People get to decide things. Um, The question and the difficulty is when you have a constitutional scheme of government and you have a constitution that um, does protect certain (coughs) rights and it does so in a circumstance in which those rights, whatever they are, enumerated or or not, are... um, might be things that the people have disagreed with. That's the tension. That um, that although we have democracy as we do, and people vote um, and and should absolutely, um, we also have a constitution that protects certain rights against the sort of majority will about those things. But the rub, of course, is. I agree with everything you said, but the rub is these are unenumerated rights. Yes. They're read into the Constitution. Yes. Um, And what troubles me, I'm not saying I disagree with all the rights that the Supreme Court has created, but I don't think we talk honestly enough about how those rights should be adjudicated. For example, uh, I'm not asking you to comment on this. I think you already have, but but when... uh, President Biden announced your appointment, or at least shortly before, he talked about, I want a judge that's going to read new rights into the Constitution through the Ninth Amendment. Um, and I'm sure some Americans are saying that's a good thing, but you got a lot of Americans going, hey, wait a minute. The Supreme Court isn't elected. I... Uh, A couple years ago, Chief of Staff Ron Klain wrote an opinion piece, and he said he hopes, and I'm going to quote, um, that, the, quote, the Supreme, I hope the Supreme Court will intervene whenever the nation's conscience and laws need a jolt in a progressive direction. That's policy making. Do you agree with that statement? Do I do I agree with the statement that that's policy making? Or no, did you I'm agree sorry. with what the chief said, Senator? That's a political statement made by someone in the executive branch. Um, okay. I'm I'm not going to push it on. Push it. On <laughs> I get it. It's not a good time to make the chief of staff mad, is it? <laughs> 
Well, I, I, I just I hope you'll keep this in mind, Judge, if you're confirmed. I mean, this is what judicial restraint is all about. And I think part of the division in our country, um, America's a big, wide open, diverse, sometimes dysfunctional, but sometimes imperfect, but basically good country. But we, we, we have different values. That's part of our diversity. And I think our country works because of our system of federalism. Um, the values in Louisiana may be different from the values in Maine. And if you don't like what's going on in Maine and you don't you like what's going on in Louisiana, you can move. But our, as our federal government has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, um, what, 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 what we had is what has developed, at least here in Washington, is this managerial elite. And I'm, when I say the managerial elite, I mean I mean the entrenched politicians. I guess I shouldn't say entrenched because that's pejorative, but we do have a lot of politicians that have been here a long time. Um, they're members of the media that are part of the managerial elite. They're members of the administrative state. They're academics that are part of it. Uh, there are a lot of corporate phonies that are part of it. And many people in this, this cabal think they are smarter and more virtuous than the American people. And that they ought to set forth how people should live their lives. People should shut up and just do what they're told. And if they behave, maybe the manager of the elite will let them eat meat occasionally. And I think that's part of the division in our country. And I think to some extent, the Supreme Court, I don't want to say contributes to it, but it needs to be mindful of this. I'll give you another example. And this case bothers me. I'm, I want you to explain it. Um, I think Lindsay talked to you about it, but I don't know that. I, I want to hear you explain it. It's Make the Road New York versus McClellan. You remember that one. I do. Yeah. Here, here's the way I read it. Congress, we, in a rare moment of consensus, gave DS, DHS the sole and unreviewable, those are not my words, they're in the statute, the sole and unreviewable right to determine when illegal immigrants should be removed on an expedited basis. The Department of Health of uh, uh, Homeland Security, taking this statute, decided to use its sole and unreviewable authority or discretion to state that we're going to have expedited removal of all illegal immigrants who've been in the U.S. less than two years. And you said no. And not only that, but you issued a universal injunction. And I don't understand why. You talked about judicial activism, and I don't see how clear Congress could have been. Now, the D.C. Circuit reversed you, but I'm, I want to hear your reasons for, for issuing that nationwide injunction. Thank you, Senator, for allowing me to uh, address that decision in that case. The statute at issue gave discretion to DHS to determine the amount of time that a person needed to have been in the country between zero and 24 months in order to be subject to expedited removal as opposed to the normal removal process in the immigration system. Mm -hmm. The statute said that DHS had sole discretion, meaning no I interpreted, meaning no other uh, agency was to have the authority to make that determination. And the statute said that DHS's determination in that regard was unreviewable, meaning it was final. Once, this is how I'm, ter I'm interpreting, um, meaning that once the decision was made, it was over. Nobody else 
gets to review. The court doesn't get to say, um, no, you're wrong if you pick 12 months, for example, or 16 months or 24 months, as they did in this case. The statute did not speak to whether Congress intended with that grant of very broad discretion to exclude another statute that Congress has passed that directs agencies when Congress gives them discretion, it, the other statute, the APA, directs agencies as to how they go about making decisions that Congress has given them the authority to make. The APA is a procedural statute. It says to agencies, when Congress gives you discretion to make a determination, you have to do so in a way that's not arbitrary and capricious. You have to use your expertise. Right. In certain kinds of decisions, you have to use notice and comment in order to get information. It's procedural. The claim that was being made in this case, as I read it and understood it, was not that the agency couldn't pick 24 months. Because obviously, Congress had said in the statute, you can pick between zero and 24 months. The claim that was being made is that the agency picked 24 months arbitrarily in violation of Congress's direction about how you go about the exercise. APA was violated? Yes. The claim was an APA violation. So no one was saying that the statute was violated in the sense that the agency did something that it couldn't have done per the statute, picking 24 months. They said the APA was violated because, this is the claim that they were making, Sure. because the agency did no analysis, the agency did no expertise, the agency did not evaluate, okay, if you've been here six months, these are the kinds of ties that you have, if you've been here 18 okay. months, right? The agency didn't do anything. Essentially, according to the claimants, the agency heard the president say, we're going to now do 24 months when everybody else, all of the other administrations up to this I'm point. I'm because I've only got two. Yes, I'm sorry. All right. As, as I, so, what I hear you saying is, tell me if I'm wrong. Yes. They, they didn't follow the APA, in your opinion, which you have to do even though Congress passed the statute? Is that well, no, because... Two things. One is the APA under DC longstanding DC Circuit case law is presumptively applicable to every situation in which an agency is exercising its discretion. So that's the first thing. It's always there as a background rule. So the DC Circuit has said Congress has to be pretty clear when it decides to exclude the APA, when it's saying, I'm giving you discretion, but you can do this arbitrarily, you can do it however you want. And in other places in the immigration statute that sets up expedited removal, Congress says, we are excluding the APA. We're telling you that with respect to this kind of discretion, the APA doesn't apply. Okay. So here I had these two statutes, and there are canons of statutory interpretation that says that you should try to give effect to all of the will of Congress. You should try to read statutes so that they go together in a way if you have these two directives. And there's also DC Circuit case law. Judge, I gotta stop you. All right. Because I'm, I got it. <laughs> and, 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 and let me just say, I agree that the DC Circuit reversed me. They disagreed with my interpretation and that's the way that our system works. Let me ask this last question. This is, this is a question about based on your experience. Can we agree that if, I want to emphasize if, cocaine is cocaine, that crack cocaine is equal in, in its, its danger to powdered cocaine? You with me? I think so. <laughs> One is not more dangerous than the other. If that's true, mm. then the sentencing rules ought to be the same. Okay? I don't, it's a policy I, matter for Congress. You could make them differently if you right. wanted this, to. This, this one I want to ask you. Yeah. Based on your experience, you've yeah. been on the bench a decade. Yes. Is crack more cocaine more dangerous than powder or less or the same? 
Senator, that's a policy determination. That's what policymakers do. They look at the evidence related to these things and they decide what's more dangerous. But what have you seen? What yeah. should I have seen evidence um, through the Sentencing Commission that the two compositions are chemically uh, similar, um, so similar as to be indistinguishable. Mm -hmm. um, and the commission, for very many years, um, as a policymaking body, indicated its view that they should be uh, equivalent and lobbied Congress concerning that. And Congress made a determination about, in the policy realm, um, making it 18 to 1 instead of 100 to 1, which is what it had previously meant. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Chairman.